You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached the age of 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Finding Genius podcast. I have Nicole Catherine Wojtovich. Uh, Dr. Wojtovich is out of Northwestern University. Uh, she's an Associate Director for Women's Health Research at New Northwestern University. So we're going to be talking about uh, the intersection of uh, how sex and gender plays into health and disease. So, Nikki, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Oh, very well. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Yeah, I guess uh, well, to start us off, I just have a personal observation. You know, I, obviously I'm not a woman, but I've been thinking a lot about health as I do these podcasts. And I realize just, for instance, you know, when you take a medicine, as a man, you just take the medicine. But as a woman, depending on where you are in your, you know, your menstrual cycle, I wonder how the medicine would affect you differently. And then I thought, hmm, I wonder if any medicines are tested that way on you know, even even at the the rat stage or the mouse stage, but never let, never mind the human stage, to see how they affect the person. So I just wanted to start with that thought, but you know, we can continue from there. So that's a really great observation, and actually, um, it's one that's that's quite uh, important to my work. And the fact of the matter is that a majority of uh, decisions about our health is made in the context. Um, without knowledge about sex or gender. And so, for example, what you mentioned was the reproductive cycle of a woman and thinking of how that might implicate um, or affect the drugs we take or perhaps um, the therapies we might have for uh, certain diseases or disorders. And the fact of the matter is the majority of biomedical research is conducted in male, uh, both animals uh, and humans. And so a lot of what we may know about uh, the influence of sex and gender and how it impacts our health is really lacking. So what would be some of the um, first things that you think could or should be done to start addressing what really people are like and how, again, sex and gender affect health? What are some of the things that, what else comes up? So uh, that's a good question. So from a historical perspective, um, women were primarily excluded from clinical research studies based on the fact um, that their one, their monthly uh, variations in hormones were thought to confound experimental results. That was one rationale. The other one was that women have the unique ability to become pregnant, and there were uh, the exclusion of women from clinical research studies was done almost in a uh, paternalistic effect to protect women from uh, adverse effects should they become pregnant during a clinical research study. And so this thought really uh, transcended uh, clinical research and was a prevailing opinion until it was mandated in 1993 by the NIH Revitalization Act that women and minorities needed to be included in clinical research studies. Now, while that was a federal mandate in clinical research involving humans, there was no mandate for the inclusion of females in basic science research, where it's really the initial... uh, drug discovery pipeline um, in the basic sciences. The majority of research in the basic sciences continued to be done in male animals. And so really at those earliest stages of when we are trying to develop new drugs and therapies, we're not even considering the female perspective. 
Um, and some of the rationale uh, from that was that one, that the female animals are inherently too variable to work with in comparison to male animals. And we know today that that's simply not true. Um, but then in other cases, we really should be thinking about what these hormonal variations, if there are, uh, how we can perhaps exploit them for better drug design and therapy delivery um, in order to explore how sex may impact drugs and therapies and to better develop treatments for all people, both men and women. So are there any initial indications of how uh, drug use takes, I mean, uh, is altered by, for instance, a woman in different parts of her cycle? Is it, you know, it, it needs to be studied, obviously, but is there any clinical results and indication of what's happening? Is there a really big difference? I would suspect there would be. So um, that's a good question. I think one of the big answers is we don't exactly know. We know that hormones, and especially, especially uh, in women, uh, certain conditions can be triggered or um, exacerbated by fluctuations in the monthly menstrual cycle. But how we can fine-tune drug therapies to that is, is still um, something that I don't think it, we're, we're quite there yet from a pharmaceutical perspective. But I will say one of the biggest examples as to why we need to be doing these sorts, the sorts of, this sort of research, um, exploring sex and gender differences when developing therapies and therapeutics, um, one example that comes to mind is the drug Ambien. Ambien is one of the most commonly prescribed uh, sleep agents, and it was found that um, men and women were actually having different effects of this drug because women were metabolizing it slower. They were waking up and receiving uh, adverse side effects and extra drowsiness compared to males. And so Ambien is one of the examples of one of the first drugs where there is sex-specific dosing guidelines um, based on metabolism alone. And so that's just one example out of, I'm sure there may be more coming down the pipeline where we may need to fine tune um, these sorts of drugs or therapies by sex. Another recent example uh, was that there were differences in um, glioblastoma treatment between men and women. And that study really shows that we should be looking at um, really the data from all of our trials, both basic science and clinical by sex, to find out ways we can exploit those sex differences and perhaps fine tune um, medications and therapies so they're more personalized to the patient and um, in a promise to get towards that really personalized, individualized medicine. What's, um, you know, I've seen plenty of medicines that say, oh, avoid if nursing or while pregnant. But you know, I spoke to a company a while ago and they said that just is, um, it's not based on study. It's just a so precaution. It's, it's not really based on actual testing or results. So one of my colleagues at Northwestern, uh, she usually says that pregnant women are really the last orphans of clinical research in that a lot of, there's really a lack of research on pregnant women. Um, given the, the state, we can't really do randomized controlled trials in pregnant women and say, you know, you guys can take this drug where, you know, it might have adverse effects to a fetus, whereas you guys don't, you know, separating out that, that kind of gold standard of a clinical trial. In a lot of cases, the bioethics behind that are, you know, just not feasible. And so what we know about pregnant women um, and how different medications may react is really kind of based on exclusion um, in that, if we, we, we just kind of say, don't take anything. And this is, you know, even going as close to cough drops, cold medicine, um, other sorts of pain medications. And speaking as um, somebody who has been pregnant twice, uh, the, the lack of information we have in this area is really, um, it's really detrimental to women's health because, again, quoting my colleague, um, Pregnant women get sick, and sick women get pregnant, and we need to be able to have treatments for them. Yeah, it's funny. If, if so many drugs are said, don't use while pregnant or nursing, I mean, what's going on is not just the fetus being there during pregnancy, but the hormones are cycling in all kinds of different ways. Wouldn't that tell people, hey, uh, the cycling of hormones is a big deal, and it should have an effect on other drugs, and it should be looked at? Well, I think the biggest issue there, um, yes, it is an altered hormonal state with um, elevated hormones, but I think the biggest issue is that um, there's really, we can't um, estimate the risk that it may cause to a, a fetus. So I think that's where there is a big um, 
kind of uh, timidness to explore dr drugs in that area, and rightly so. So one of the best things we can do is actually explore the data from women who are actively taking drugs regardless for given conditions. Um, and have those women report, uh, one of the best things they could do is self-report, you know, the sorts of side effects they may experience or the results, um, birth outcomes, so to speak. And um, I think it's very hard to engage uh, women in clinical research, especially in the pregnant state. So one of the things that I think would be very helpful was would be to provide education to pregnant women about the benefit that they could provide to all other women um, by sharing this sort of information um, to research professionals. So what, um, where does everything go from here? What are some initiatives that you think will be really, really helpful? So um, one of the things that I, I briefly touched upon was that the NIH, there is a mandated NIH inclusion policy that was put into place in 1993 um, requiring the inclusion of women in clinical research. Um, and I mentioned that, um, that there wasn't a similar policy put in place for animal research. Well. In 2016, um, in 2015, the National Institutes of Health announced a policy requiring investigators to consider sex as a biological variable. And so that policy went into place, and um, we are now entering an era where uh, the research community should be considering how sex influences their research. And so I think um, it's going to really be a pivot point in how we conduct research going forward seeing that um, in order to obtain federal funding, uh, researchers will need to explain or consider uh, how sex might influence their results, or if they are doing single-sex studies, provide rationale as to why they're only including one sex. Um, so I think that's a really exciting era, and I have hope that um, moving forward, this will be um, a bigger priority to the research community. And so, quite frankly, it's an area of uncharted discovery. Uh, there's a lot of work that has yet to be done exploring sex differences for a variety of different conditions, uh, diseases, and disorders. So I think for young scientists, this is really a, a area ripe for discovery, ripe for knowledge, and hopefully that will translate to better health outcomes for all people um, in the future. Um, are there areas of medicine that you think are far more important to be aware of this? And is it all areas? And if we can't just rush into all areas and make changes, what areas are the most important you think to start this in? That's a that's another good question. I really do think that this is kind of an across the board issue. Um, some fields have been better than others about being aware of sex and gender differences, and we already know some things in certain fields versus others. Uh, but I really do think this is across the biomedical sciences. This needs to be taken into consideration. Um, for example, you know, there may be sex differences in, um, again, I mentioned, you know, a type of brain tumor is one example, but really um, there may be things out there in uh, pulmonology. Um, there's a lot we know about cardiology. Um, neuroscience, immunology especially is a really hot field right now where we know there are a lot of sex differences in um, vaccine response and the way our immune systems respond. So I really think that this is an across-the-board issue that all biomedical fields really need to be cognizant of sex and gender differences. It's not just one field. It's, it's everybody needs to get on board. Have you seen personally um, any medical data that has looked into this and if so, was it surprising or were the results underwhelming? I mean, are there any particular examples you've seen of this in action? Um, I think one of the biggest studies I saw recently to date was the, um, a study, as I mentioned, on glioblastoma, a type of brain tumor that uh, they ended up analyzing the survival data and the treatment data by sex. And just that basic analysis of breaking down the population into two male and female, they were able to pull out differences in the treatment and survival rates, hence being able to kind of tailor treatment and or look at what mechanisms differ in one sex versus the other. And I think that um, I've been using that as an example to showcase how even basic analyses, if you are including males and females in your research, which you should be doing in general, um, and a lot of clinical studies are, they now are mandated to include males and females, but they're still lacking in data analyses. So that, what that means is that they have men and women enrolled, but they're not breaking down the data by sex.
And when they look at the data by sex, you know, you may find differences, you may not. And I think that's one of the biggest pieces is that in addition to sex inclusion, we need to be doing sex-based analyses. Um, and then kind of moving forward to that, we also need to be taking gender into consideration. Um, very briefly, um, for those of you who, are, who are, may not be as familiar with the terminology, sex is really a biological construct where um, gender is the sociocultural, political, sociopolitical context, um, which uh, is related to male-like behaviors or female-like behaviors. Um, and, you know, going forward, I think even the biomedical community would would be well positioned to start analyzing data by male and female gender, gender non-conforming, gender non-binary individuals, because each of those folks will have, uh, you know, different influences in their cultural context that may impact their health. And so I think having robust analyses by both sex and gender when applicable is very important. Do you think, I mean, well, I don't even know how to define gender anymore, but um, so, so any difference in response to medical treatment, I mean, it doesn't come really from a physiology perspective, or maybe it does, I don't know. I wonder, I guess, let's say you're a, um, you know, you're a woman or you were born as a woman, but you, you, you know with all certainty that you're a man, you haven't even gone through any of any hormonal therapy or you know sex change operation whatever it is i wonder if there's there's a physiological difference in you versus someone that uh, you know doesn't feel like that well i think one of the biggest issues where gender can play out in healthcare is really um related to access um and um i think that men, women, uh, gender non-conforming individuals, gender non-binary individuals may face different abilities to access health care. Um, and we know um, and from the data that I'm familiar with, for example, I know um, based on the environment where an individual is located uh, can predict some sort of health outcomes um, or their ability to access care. Um, so I think that's something we need to be cognizant about, um, especially moving forward in um, defining health equity and access for gender non-binary and non-conforming uh, and transgendered individuals. And I think right now there's an that's an area where there's really a lack of knowledge and information, although I definitely have colleagues who are working specifically in these areas to, prove, in, to improve health equity and access um, for, um, for those individuals. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Do you, do you know anyone that's looked at physiology somehow? To see if there's any difference? Um, you know, I'm not as familiar with that area of research, but um, I think, you know, we need to be very uh, cognizant and careful uh, and inclusive when designing studies um, regarding um, physiolog physiology, and um, we need to be just very um, cognizant of any um, potential adverse results that might come from it in, in terms of um, I think there can be, I, I would shy away from saying any physiological things at the moment, um, just because I'm not as familiar with the literature. So I guess I'm not the best source on that particular question. No, that's fine. I just wonder if anyone is looking at that. I don't know, just a thought occurred to me, but I don't know, you know. Um, I don't know if you know, but that's okay. I just wondered, the thought came up. So so there's also, yeah, cultural differences and access to healthcare, like you mentioned, and, and those dynamics. I guess one issue is, you know, if I'm going to do a clinical trial and you know, I can't, I mean, it's, it's expensive enough, it's hard enough, it's long enough to do a clinical trial. And I'm sure they're, you know, obviously they're not optimal, but if you try to be inclusive and you try to have a lot of diversity in the clinical trial, then that hurts the statistics of it, which will make it even more expensive and more difficult to do. How do you see those those two things interacting? I mean, we you know we need science, we need clinical trials, we need progress. Yet there will be, I'm sure, people in groups that aren't served, you know, in the studies of a particular drug or protocol. So what do you do there? You know, that that's a big challenge. Right now, it's it's incredibly hard to recruit people for clinical research studies in general. Um, the majority of uh, participants tend to be located, um, obviously, around um, medical research, um, academic research institutions, large hospital systems, um, and, you know, historically, we've 
uh, not treated uh, marginalized or minority populations well. And so in terms of research, and there have just been, you know, atrocities in the way the research community has, has approached, um, you know, underserved populations and um, minority groups. And so there, I don't, um, trying to engage people from all backgrounds in clinical research studies is very difficult. But if we do not include or attempt to include all perspectives and backgrounds, and I'm talking, you know, socioeconomic, uh, racial, geographical, um, sexual orientation, without that information, um, we're missing big pieces of, of health. And that's really, um, it, it goes back to health equity and that we're not designing drugs and therapies for um for everyone, we're developing these drugs and therapies for a small population. While we can infer um, some things based on, you know, um, perhaps larger physiological mechanisms, you know, I think really to get to this era of personalized medicine, we it, the whole thought is looking at, you know, your DNA, but really we need to start looking at the entire person when developing personalized medicine. And really, it starts in clinical research studies, too. And at the, at the bench, I would even argue it starts really, you know, as soon as we can um, in our basic science studies. And that this will really help drive health equity and health outcomes for all people moving forward. Um, and to your point that will it cost more money? Yes. I really, you know, unfortunately, I think, yes, it will require um, a larger financial um, input. But I think, you know, if our desire is to improve health for all people, this is really what it's going to take. Very good. What's the best way for people to uh, reach out and get in touch and find out more? So you can reach out to me um, at the Women's Health uh, Research Institute, so womenshealth.northwestern.edu. I can be found on Twitter at Nikki Wojtovich. And you can learn more um, about our work at Northwestern, um, as well as reaching me by email at nicole.wojtovich at Northwestern. Very good, Nicole. Thanks for coming on the call. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you so much. I, I enjoyed uh, speaking with you, and um, yeah. I appreciate your interest in the subject. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.